Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Smarter Change, provided by Hassan Archer Consulting. I'm your host, Hassan Archer. Each session, we dive into an interview with senior leaders to understand how they have led meaningful change inside their clients, companies, and organizations. I believe lasting change within companies requires everyone to continuously assess and evaluate how they get things done in a changing world. And today, I'm excited to speak with our guest, Bill Ellemeyer. Bill Ellemeyer is one of the most well-known career transition coaches in Southern California. Bill is known for helping people figure out what they want to do in life and then helping them get connected. So, Bill, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thanks so much for having me in your show. My pleasure. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Yeah. So, Bill, to start off, why don't you just introduce yourself and tell our audience, who is Bill Ellemeyer? Who is Bill Ellemeyer? Well, you know, in a word, I'm a connector, but uh, going uh, deep, I spent a number of years in the HR business back uh, in the day, and um, uh, having lost my job uh, uh, as VP HR at AirCal, um, uh, forced to take a good look at what I was doing, and I started out of that uh, trauma, became, uh, I started the executive outplacement business in Southern California back in the 80s and sold it to uh, Lee Hecht Harrison in the 90s. And I've been a career transition coach for 35 plus years. Uh, came out of the Navy and into the corporate world. I was an um, air intelligence officer in the Navy for a couple, four, four years before I started the corporate world. And I have a sidebar interest in music. Had a radio show called House of the Blues back in the, in the 60s. So I'm very diverse in my interests. Uh, reading and learning are uh, two of my favorite activities. And uh, again, I appreciate you having me on your show. Awesome. You're a fascinating man, Bill, as I've had the pleasure to get to know you over the past several months. Um, you, you, your diversity of interests, I think, and experiences is really what makes you effective, helping people figure out what their next step is in life. And, and we'll get into that today on the show. So um, we talk about career transition coaching, and I feel like there's a lot of people who say that they're in that business, um, but that you know, it gets mixed up with recruiters and executive search firms. Um, you know, how, how do you describe career transition coaching and what you actually do? Well, essentially, I, I work for two kinds of individuals. Number one, the unemployed, my target market. They're usually mid to senior level executives, uh, usually somewhere, I would say the average age of my clients would be maybe 50. And uh, with all the change going on in the world, people are looking at, uh, am I on the right horse for the next 10 years? So that precipitates them finding me and uh, working with me. Uh, the second thing is I'm an uh, inveterate connector. I'm always uh, thinking about who uh, needs to know who. So i probably one of the few people in the business that actually helps my client build a, a real network of um, meaningful connections. So generally I'm working with the unemployed, maybe um, about um, half of my clients are unemployed. The rest are employed, but unhappy. Uh, the Gallup survey, uh, the Gallup poll, says that 70% of the workforce is some level of unhappy, and 30% mm -hmm. of those are very unhappy. Those are my target market. So lately, three out of the last four clients have been working. Uh, can be any number of reasons that they want to make a change. Maybe the culture of the company, maybe the future of the company is in doubt. Maybe a relationship with a um, toxic boss. Uh, there's all kinds of, maybe a commute that's uh, untenable. I've had people, uh, uh, senior level people that commuted for an hour and a half uh, one way. That was just uh, too hard on the soul, if you know what I mean. So these are all reasons that I work with those two categories. So when we're looking at making career transitions like this, obviously the group that is unemployed, they're really searching right now for that next job. I, I've been in that situation and there's a lot of pressure to, you know, fix cash flow issues and get back on the horse. Um, but the ones that really interest me are the ones who are in the other 30% you mentioned, the ones who maybe are looking for some, they have something. So it's not necessarily a financial situation they're looking for, but they're looking for what's a better fit. Um, tell me more about that and how you work with those people. Well, most people get into their job and employment in a serendipitous way. They, there's not a whole lot of planning. When you're coming out of school early on, they want a job. And wherever that happens to land is what they, what they end up doing. Now, they might be very good at it, and they might work 20 years in, in an area that they're good at, but they're not just necessarily passionate about it. 
So helping people reconnect with the passion they had when they were first starting out in their career is something I like to do. If you can integrate some at least interest in the field, because again, I meet people all the time that are doing a good job, but they're not passionate about it. Well, if you're going to be working, if you're say 50 and you're going to work another 25, 30 years, you better get into something that you feel good about and that you can sustain yourself because work and life go together. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about my, um, my interest in uh, what I call unretirement. Yeah. So for these people who are looking at another 25 to 30 years, um, do you find them doing major like left turns and something completely different? Like they're an executive at a, I don't know, a software firm and then they decide they want to start painting. Is it that level of change or is it something generally a little bit less uh, drastic? Probably a little, little bit less, uh, although there are, you know, radical changes such as what you just described where somebody uh, follows their passion for uh, something artistic or something that's in them. Sometimes when I'm uh, going through the, the assessment phase, when I work with a client is the most important. A lot of times people are just starting out, I got to have a resume and then let's, what are the job seeking, um, you know, best things to be doing to find a job without ever taking the time to look at who they are and what they want to be and where they're going. It's not about the next gig or the next job. It's about the next 10 years, 10, 20 years preparing for, um, for that. And uh, we're looking at it for the long run, as opposed to just plugging into another job. I mean, I meet uh, CEOs and very, very senior executives all the time that are very stressed and very unhappy. On paper, it looks like they've got the world by the tail. But when you re really talk, they have no time for friends or family. They're very stressed. Uh, they're, they're, their whole life is work. And they have no balance. And um, they find me because they need to make a change. Yeah. I've talked to some people um, about career transitions. I did a little bit of this work when I used to work at the, at the university in the career department. And the thing that holds a lot of people back is just fear, right? It's okay, well, things may be terrible here. Culturally, it's not a good fit for me or I'm too stressed, but what if I make a change and it doesn't work? And then I'm in a situation that's worse with a worse boss or my financial house is not in order. What do you, what do you tell people maybe who want to talk to you, but they're afraid of, of that level of change? Well, you know, obviously to get ahead in, uh, in, in life and employment, you've got to take a risk, but it should be an educated risk. So again, uh, the uh, assessing yourself, there's a number of books going way back to what colors your parachute that talk about a lot of, about assessment and, and learning who you are, learning what your inherent skills and motiva motivated abilities are, getting at those core skills, maybe five or six skills you have and looking though at those and how you can deploy those in a job and in a career. And a lot of people just skip that whole area. So uh, quite frequently when I'm working with an individual, we'll find a different career path or we'll, we'll help them build a portfolio career where they'll, they'll do several things to earn a living. And, and ultimately uh, that's the way the world is, is trending and we'll be talking about that a little down the road. But there's a lot of choices, but the front end is so important. So the first three or four meetings I have with a client are all about their background, what they've achieved in life, and then I analyze those achievements. If you look at a, across a person's life at say five or six of their achievements, and you pull out the inherent skills that show up in each of them, you'll see trends or themes. Maybe they're an organizer, planner, manager. Maybe they're a problem solver. Maybe they're a great communicator. But you want to get these four or five skills, and then you put those together with their experience, and their values. And then together, my client and I choose a primary objective and then also a secondary. Primary might be another corporate job or, the, or it might be to start or buy a business. Boomers are selling businesses at a tremendous rate these days. So if you find a small business and you have the experience in that field, in that area, and you see they're doing 5 million, but you know that you could take it to 10 million, you might find a private equity company to put up 80% of the funds, you put some skin in the game, and now you've got your own company. And that can happen. Um, and people not, have not necessarily thought of that. Or it could be as simple as starting with your core business, your consultants, consultancy, and then looking at things that might go together with that, like teaching, teaching a course one night a week. So I, I like that idea of keeping your options open and assessing 
you know, your skills, your successes, which like do the access assessment phase. The other piece of what you mentioned you do is you work with people to, to, to connect them. And I remember when I first met you, the person who introduced us said to me, Hassan, I want you to meet Bill. He's the most connected man in Orange County. And I definitely believe that's true, having gotten to know you. Um, so tell me about, a bit about the connection part of your business and how you do that. Well, I get a lot of pleasure out of connecting people uh, to uh, opportunity and to other people. I started an executive uh, roundtable seven years ago. We get 40, 50 people uh, for seven years. Now we're on Zoom. But uh, people from uh, private equity, turnaround, workout, small business owner, and bringing them together uh, in a format uh, that's interesting and changing, uh, I watch the magic happen. So bringing people together and getting them connected, net this gets into the core of what networking is. Networking is really serving the other person. And uh, as you know, I'm a big book guy. So if anybody's uh, interested in really getting what you can do to uh, be known out there in the marketplace, there's a book uh, by Justin Blaney up in Seattle. He's a business writer, and it's two words, Famously Helpful. Famously Helpful is the book. If you read that book, you're going to find all kinds of things that you didn't think of that are a way to serve others and to get visibility in the marketplace. And if you follow all of them, you would become famous. So I'm, I'm always thinking when I meet somebody, I learn enough about them by asking questions. So when you're networking, forget talking about yourself initially and ask questions of the other person. That's the key to networking, is to figure out how you can serve the other person. What might you be, what could you do when you meet somebody? Well, if you ask a few questions, you can give them an article, you can give them a title of a book, as I just did, you can give them an event, you can connect them to a webinar or a seminar or a person, any number of those things. Then the other person will say, oh, Hassan cares about me. We have a chance to build a relationship. So again, it's taking the concern off yourself when you're in a networking situation and, and take an interest in the other person uh, primarily. And then you have an opportunity to follow on. And then from that can begin the beginning of building a real relationship. And relationship says, Richard Branson, he credits his success by always reaching out beyond his core business. So I think he started in the music business and then he went into the airline business and medical and now he's in the space business and who knows what tomorrow. But my point is, he validates the need to reach beyond your particular industry. People tend to cocoon in their own business, in their own industry. I can't tell you the number of times I've met a senior executive who's now 54, and he will say, or she will say, you know, I knew I should have been building my network. I wanted to, but I never did. And they're chagrined to say that. And they say, I won't make that mistake again. Because when I work with somebody, I'm teaching them, this is not something you do just to get a job. This is a lifelong activity. And that's what networking really is. You know, I, I'm really glad to hear you say that, Bill, because a lot of the people that I've met with uh, throughout my career, especially, I think, younger people, they look at networking as a, almost a selfish activity, where it's, how exactly. many how many numbers can I achieve? How big is my LinkedIn count? How many best business cards do I have? Yep. Uh, and if you go to a networking event that's held you know, in the evening or those group events, you'll see those people just frantically running around, yep. shaking hands, you know, like they're running for office. <laughs> um, but there's not a relationship being built there. And that's yep. something I think is missing in our, our day of networking to me is relationship building. Because if you have the relationships, that gives you a network. If you know a bunch of random people who know nothing about you and have no connection to you, that's not really that helpful. Does that? Absolutely. Sense? You know, I have a saying for years, your network is your net worth. And, uh, you know, the most connected people are usually the most ta talented and the most valuable. I mean, at the senior level, there's a book, another book called Give and Take by Adam Grant. And it's about the people who in Silicon Valley who rose to the top, who tend to be givers as opposed to takers. The takers might look like in the short run they're getting ahead, but it's the givers who, who are giving with no thought of anything in return that become famous and become leaders and become uh, talented uh, founders and CEOs of some of the top companies up there in, um, in Silicon Valley. Awesome. So let me just um, turn us a little bit here because you mentioned the word unretirement, which is interesting. What, is, what does that mean? What is unretirement? Well, um, 
Hassan, I've brought several people in the last couple of years out of retirement because retirement is a, is, is a dirty word to me. Retirement says uh, you're not connected, you're not a player, you're not in the game, you're old. So I never let people say I'm retired. It sends a, a, the wrong message because life and work, again, as I said earlier, go together. So people who are 60, uh, I tell them they have another 25 years of work if they know how to take care of themselves. So retirement is really becoming obsolete. The iconic people like Warren Buffett, I think he is, what, 89, something like that. Tony Bennett still singing with Lady Gaga at 90, 94, whatever he is, you know. So my point is retirement is an obsolete idea. And I've been preaching and teaching this for a long time because people my age that I have seen uh, do the traditional retirement where they uh, it's leisure and golf and vacations, um, they don't necessarily do well because unless you have purpose and some passion for something, it doesn't necessarily have to be paid work, but keeping your hand in the game. I have a number of people that work uh, maybe um, 40, 50% of the time. Um, and these people are up in their eighties and uh, they're very happy because again, uh, this is a health thing. Uh, it's, it, you know, if you're not working, you're not using your brain. So the most important part of health is to be use, doing, <laughs> using your brain and the, the first thing that atrophies if you aren't using your brain and you're just observing life um, is, is that and then the body will follow so uh, work and life go together and I mean I know people working well running in businesses that are into their 90s it's a very different world from what our parents um, observed and uh, followed the um, I think people look at retirement as I can't wait to get there because now I can stop doing 40 hours a week yep. or 50 or whatever it is at this thing. If you're a lawyer or a doctor or a desk worker. Um, but I think to your point about staying active and using your brain, I think when you think about the nature of work changing, because you talk a little bit about portfolio careers. Um, and I, I wonder if that's something that people just don't really consider. And so they think about work is just, I'm going to keep doing what I keep doing until I stop as opposed to maybe there's another way for me to build a career that looks different for where I am at that stage of life. Yeah, no, I invented the term. Uh, well, not the term, the term was tossed around, but I invented it in this way. Portfolio career means using your core skills over multiple streams of income. So you have your core business, which may is usually consulting or your, your area of expertise, but then nothing is forever and it's always changing. So I always have what I call add-ons. So one of the first things people do that come out into uh, this, uh, this area of working on their own is teaching a course one night a week. Oh, I'm making 2,500 a month now doing that. Maybe I'll teach two courses. So earning money on, in addition to your core job is something that I am, I've got two pages of things that people have done in the past um, that uh, add to their core business. And so I've got people that have two or three or four sources of income. It could be board work, it could be writing, could be teaching, it could be podcasting, <clears throat> any number of things. Could be a digital newsletter. There's just a, a, a wealth. Of, I, have, I have a client who plays the violin uh, one night a week in a classical orchestra. I have another one imports suits from his brother in Italy that he gets very inexpensively. And these are very, very fancy, very famous That's suits. Amazing. Until COVID, having a suit was important. <laughs> now, yeah. <laughs> so much. Hopefully, we'll go back to <laughs> where we can wear suits again. You know. Yeah. If ever. But uh, in any event, uh, you know, <laughs> this is um, something that I've preached for a long time. Nothing is for the average corporate job, uh, two to three years. So if you're 55, what's the point of getting another corporate job if you know when you're 59 or 60, you're going to be out on the street again? You have to learn to launch and get out on your own at some point for the long run. Because mm -hmm. again, if you're 60, you got 25 years of work in front of you. It doesn't mean necessarily full time. It could be. Yeah. These are things you need to be thinking about and things are uh, changing. And I think, I think the, uh, the so-called gig economy, and there is a great book called The Gig Economy, um, talks about 20% of the uh, professional workforce in the U.S. today is in this project-oriented gig economy. And um, so it's, it's growing. And um, because we have a, a big cohort of people, you know, over 65. And um, 
So this is something that uh, is growing and will be will be part of the future. Yeah. So let's let's take a look then at this through the lens of COVID because now we're all at home. You know, you and I like to get together and talk, but I know that's not an option for a lot of people for health reasons or right. you know, requirements their area. So what does how does all this change specifically looking at networking? Now that we don't have that face to face and it's all through Zoom or through phone calls, how does that change? Yeah, it's changing radically. And of course, uh, the advent of uh, like what we're doing here, Zoom has been phenomenal. Um, you know, so obviously the, the primary way to uh, network through social media is LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is a vast, uh, you know, wealth of con connections and, and, and ideas. And uh, you, you start with that. So everybody is, that's, that's the way we go out networking now is through LinkedIn, some other social media, but LinkedIn for any professional is the, the place you wanna go. And you learn as much as you can and then you contact and you have a conversation. And then you set up to have coffee at a, a, a socially distanced outdoor venue. I've got about a half a dozen places in Orange County that are terrific places where I can go. They're outside of a restaurant, They've set up a nice a venue in the parking lot with a tent, uh, maybe railings around it. It's actually quite nice to the extent that as long as the weather's like this, I prefer meeting outside anyway rather than inside. But, you know, I, I find that since there's no networking events, I try to meet people one-on-one, -on -one, again, at a socially distanced outdoor venue and uh, learn as much as I can about them and put them into my network by serving them. And they in turn serve me. That's how I've been building my business. Took me a while to get into it because when COVID came, it shut me down because I was used to going to a networking event where I would get five or six cards from people. Then I would follow up with coffee. We well, can't do that anymore. So it took me a while to figure out how to get connected. Now I try to get two or three meetings a day at a Starbucks or a local a venue that's outside. And there are some great ones around and uh, building my network one, one at a time. And again, figuring out how I can serve them so that we have the potential of building an ongoing relationship, just as I met you, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely met outside, outside a couple of times. Uh, and that, that's been very effective for us to build our relationship. So the other piece of COVID is the economy's uneven. You know, nobody knows what's gonna happen in six months, three months, I mean, even in a month, we don't know if California, where we both live, is going to shut down or have more restrictions. So it seems to me that the idea of a job and understanding kind of a straight line between today and six months and nine months is, is kind of murky. So I think from my perspective, having a portfolio career is not just a thing about later in life, but it's also about how you thrive today. You know, I, I had a friend of mine who said to me, Hassan, with all the craziness in COVID, you can either sit there and panic about it and worry about it and worry about your job, or you can say to yourself, this is a chance to get ahead and I'm going to pass them in the turns, right? I'll pass the competition in the turns when things get wavy. So in terms of portfolio careers, do you think people should start now earlier in their careers or should they start, or is that something that they should spend more time building their core career and then come to you, you know, 50, like you said, your average client, what's, what would you suggest for people now with COVID? Oh, absolutely. They should start now. Everybody should do at least have one, uh, activity uh, in, in addition to their regular job. It could be mentoring, could be teaching, could be uh, speaking, could be writing a newsletter, but having a, a side gig, if you will, uh, when you're even as a, in your 30s and start thinking that way. Because again, the future is all about change, rapid change, and keeping up with it. So you need to be building these capabilities outside your job. Also, when you lose a job, as, as all jobs have a beginning, but they also have an ending. So you want to be prepared. Prepared. And if you put all your eggs in one basket and you lose the basket, uh, it's much more difficult. So being able to reach out and build relationships and, and, and find some, some of these things that can make money. And there are, I have two pages of, of uh, ways to make money that people most of the time have not thought of. And again, there's, there's lots of books on, on that too. But it's very important to start thinking that way early in your career because the average corporate job, as you know, is what, two, two, three years. So, you know, many people have 10 jobs before they get into their, you know, 50s 
and uh, start uh, figuring out how to reinvent themselves for the next 30 years. Yeah. Is that my phone? So you just said something very interesting about it kind of turns the dynamic on its head with jobs because I think yeah. a lot of people say when I have a full-time job that is job security and I could never leave my job I can never start a side business I can never become an entrepreneur because that's too risky but what you're almost saying is your job that you think is going to be secure is not secure right two to three years you may be switching out of jobs or with the economy as it is now or in the future you may be laid off and then those things don't happen on your timeline. That's somebody else's timeline. That's the macroeconomic timeline. But what you're saying is almost, it's more secure for you to take control of your own career, build your portfolio career, think ahead, plan ahead, think about what kind of a gig career you want to have and prepare for that now, rather than doubling down on trying to make your current employment your permanent employment. Yes, it's very risky to to, uh, to not <clears throat> be thinking along these lines and to reach out and build other sources of income because, again, uh, things are accelerating. So jobs are more tenuous and jobs are also going it away at a, going away at a tremendous rate. Uh, in the future, there's not going to be as many jobs. So we're going to have to, as of necessity, learn to create work and learn to bring something to the workplace uh, as as an independent contractor, if you will. And it can be very, very simple to maybe starting uh, teaching a course or writing a newsletter. Or any, there's any number of things that can be done. So again, you have to start thinking about that early. Um, you know, I, I have people who say to me, gee, Bill, maybe you can help me get a permanent job. And I laugh. I mean, you know, to face it, there are no permanent jobs. Maybe working for, the, you know, the, uh, the, the government in some kind of a job. And maybe, uh, you know, a professor that gets tenured. But even there, those, those things change too. So, again, you have to start thinking very early uh, about this uh, in, in one's 30s about uh, how to make a living for the long run and not just relying on a corporation to take care of you. Because believe me, they won't. Uh, when it's in their interest, the whole area of ex executive outplacement started back in the uh, 90s because corporations uh, were right-sizing or downsizing and... Uh, and they were using outplacement as a way, two things. Some, they wanted to legitimately um, you know, give back to people that had spent long service with them and they were motivated um, sincerely to help them. Others uh, was more to avoid litigation. Uh, people laying, getting laid off tend to sometimes be very unhappy and that can lead to a lot of you know, uh, filing of suits against the company for unfair um, you know, a dismissal, that mm -hmm. type of thing. That's how the outplacement business grew. And I rode the crest of that A, the crest of that wave for 10 years before selling to an international outplacement firm. I had the, uh, I had an office in LA, San Diego and uh, Irvine. So um, things have um, changed ever since we started out there. And things will continue to change as we go forward. And from what you're saying, they're going to change faster and faster. Oh, faster and faster. Another, I'll just give you one more book. It's a, it's a gem. If you want to know what's going to happen in the next decade, uh, in the next 10 years, uh, because we're in a period of great disruption, the book is called The Storm Before the Calm. The Storm Before the Calm by George Friedman. It's not about politics, not about Washington. It's about the geopolitical things going on in the world and why the chain and the end of several eras uh, and why they are all happening at once and why that means great disruption. But beyond that 10 years, things could be looking real good. It's just, uh, you, it, you get a good chance to see the future here for the next few years and reading that book. It's so compelling, it's like reading a novel. It really tells uh, the core of who Americans uh, are and how we got to be this way and why we create more business, more innovation in one day um, than the rest of the world combined because one of the metaphors he uses were inventors from Thomas Edison to Elon Musk. I think he has three metaphors. The cowboy mentality was first. That means I wanna do it on my own. I wanna be self-sufficient. I don't want any help. Uh, don't tell me what to do. That's the mm -hmm. cowboy mentality. And the second one, of course, inventor. And then the third one is warrior. We've always been, um, we started this country at, 
you know, warring against uh, King George the Third, and um, you know, and riots and the Boston Tea Party, and this this country was formed on uh, protest and uh, and and change. So uh, those are the three metaphors. But that book, and George um, Friedman is a highly noted geopolitician, uh, political writer, and he uh, wrote a book uh, back uh, ten years ago called The Next One Hundred Years. So he's very forward thinking. I highly recommend it. Awesome. Well, thank you for that recommendation, Bill. Yeah. So you have a, obviously a wealth of information. I know we're out of time for today, but how would our listeners connect with you, learn from you, and just start to um, think through some of these, these future plans? Well, you know, I'm pretty old school, as you know. I've been around a long time, but I still use the telephone. So, um, you know, if somebody can text me, 714-803-9805. Glad to answer questions. I help people in transition all the time that are not clients. I'm always good for some ideas or connections. Again, it's 714-803-9805. My email is bill at ellermeyerconnect, two words all together, dot com. Bill at ellermeyerconnect.com. So um, obviously, um, I'm, uh, I'm helping and serving uh, the people in the community. Um, I've worked through a lot of uh, religious organizations uh, where they'll have job search uh, club uh, type activity, and I'll come and speak to them. I've done that for years. So uh, I'm always good for uh, helping people in, in a way just a, as simple as a phone call. I'll usually come up with an idea or a place or an event or somebody. So uh, love to do it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Bill. It's been a pleasure to have you here today as a guest. Thank you so much. Hope we can do it again sometime. We definitely will. So everyone, thanks for joining us today. Please hit subscribe and visit me on HassanArcher.com and LinkedIn. And remember that if you've led meaningful change in your company or industry, please reach out, please reach out to me. Maybe we can interview you in a future episode.